uh, today we are going to talk about how to generate femtosecond pulses of different wavelengths for applications like uh, pump probe spectroscopy. As we have talked about the amplifiers earlier, the reason why we want to use amplifiers is that for many applications you want uh, to use a laser pulse that is really very intense. And the way you do it as we have discussed is first you use a uh, seed laser, an oscillator, you feed it into another laser which is an amplifier and we have learned different techniques of uh, elongating the laser pulse, feeding it into the uh, cavity of amplifier by using pockel cell, then switching it out using another pockel cell or maybe the same pockel cell and then uh, compressing it once again to get an amplified pulse which is uh, which is uh, short as well. Now, uh, the issue with this chart pulse amplification method that we have uh, discussed earlier is that you can only get uh, one modal wavelength. Of course, we know that femtosecond pulse by itself is broadband, we are not talking about that. But if you think of the uh, modal wavelength, there is no way in which you can tune it because the seed pulse has to have exactly the same uh, frequency as the one that will come out, well when I say frequency I mean modal frequency as the one that will come out of the amplifier. So, if you uh, try to tune the seed, then you have to play around with the amplifier laser cavity and all that and then uh, alignment becomes problematic. I am not saying that uh, tunable amplifiers are not there, they are there, but alignment there is a non-trivial process. So, what one needs to do is one needs to uh, work on the pulses post production if you want to generate uh, pulses with different uh, central frequencies and the way it is done is called optical parametric generation and optical parametric amplification. So, these once again are nonlinear optical techniques and as we are going to see they are exactly the opposite of what we have studied earlier second harmonic generation and some frequency generation, some frequency generation to be more general. So, as you know in some frequency generation what we do is we take a light of two different frequencies and we have in our previous discussion we have developed this uh, uh, concept of signal and idler, we have talked about the relative frequencies of signal idler and pump and there what we said is that the pump is the highest frequency right. The pulse with highest frequency is called the pump pulse and that time it might have sounded a little counterintuitive because there you are actually producing the pump, but when we say pump we think of something that is going in right. The reason why we introduced it at that time is what we are going to use now. So, earlier we have studied some frequency generation not very difficult to understand by considering virtual states. We said it is sort of like two uh, droplets of water joining up to giving you a droplet of uh, to give you a droplet of bigger mass. Similarly, you have two photons of smaller energy which join up to give you a single photon of a, a higher energy. And what we explained was that you have this material in ground state then let us say omega s comes in the signal frequency, it, the system gets promoted to a virtual state and then at the same instant if omega i comes in it will get promoted to higher uh, virtual state frequency of uh, the, the energy gap between which and the ground state would be uh, say h omega p where omega p equal to omega i plus omega s. And then when since it is a virtual state it has 0 lifetime. So, when relaxation takes place in within 0 lifetime the light that comes out has frequency of omega p which is omega s plus omega i and that is not very difficult to understand right omega s plus omega i combining to give you omega p. What we want to talk about now is whether it is possible to do the reverse. We have omega p which is a higher frequency is it possible to break it down into uh, two photons, one with frequency omega p, omega s and another with frequency omega i. And the answer is yes, but this is uh, not as efficient a process as its inverse. 
it is much easier to combine omega i and omega s to give you omega p than to take omega p and break it down into omega s and omega i that is point number 1. And we are not going to get into the uh, detailed uh, quantitative treatment of this that itself can be a course. But what we are trying to do here is that we are trying to develop the general idea of uh, how this is done. Now, can you just looking at this expression does it occur to you that there is a potential problem or potential issue or potential feature associated with breaking up omega p into omega s and omega i. That problem is not there when you start with omega s and omega i and produce omega p which is a sum of their frequencies. When I want to break down into constituents there is something that should strike us what is that feature I am thinking about. See when we do some frequency you start with omega s and omega i there some can be only one quantity there is no problem with that. But you start with omega p there can be in principle infinite combinations of omega s and omega i right. So, there is no predetermined value at least uh, at this moment we will see later on whether uh, it is possible to bring in some predetermined value. But as of now all that is required is omega p must be omega s plus omega i right. So, that reminds me of a story that I read as a child that there was an arithmetic problem in which it was said that uh, 10 pens cost 50 rupees how much does 1 pen cost and a student wrote we cannot say. And when he was asked why you cannot say he said see I mean nowhere is it written that they all cost the same. So, I can buy 1 pen for 5 rupees, 1 pen for 10 rupees and have some kind of a combination and there are many different combinations that are possible. So, actually that student was right. So, you have to say that uh, the each pen costs the same. Here we cannot say each pen costs the same okay? or maybe we can as we will see later right, but this is what it is. Now this thing takes place and it is actually a complicated process when you produce these uh, photons they are correlated and uh, the science of this goes beyond our uh, requirement of producing uh, light of different frequencies. Actually what you produce here is correlated photons and that opens up a uh, different branch altogether. Uh, in our institute we had this talk by Professor Mukamel couple of weeks ago you might remember that he did mention in the passing correlated photons right. So, this is where it starts. Now, when you do it let us say we can do it that a uh, pump light gets into a nonlinear uh, crystal and gets broken up into signal and idler. First thing that we want to say is you cannot have infinite combinations little while ago we said at least at that point I could write any value of omega s any value of omega i as long as they add up to omega p that is not necessarily correct. Because not only do you need energy conservation momentum has to be conserved as well as we had discussed for some frequency generation. The moment you say momentum has to be conserved the number of possibilities goes down right yeah. And also directionality has a role to play now because it is just splitting. Now I can combine this case and ki and the vector sum can be k pump, but you can see that if I have a longer case going higher up and I have a longer ki then again you, I, you can have the same vector sum right if you change the angle. So, once again it is going to depend on the angle at which the uh, photons propagate right and for a uh, completely collinear geometry the equation that you get is once again you might remember that we had discussed that those polar plots and all and we said that the condition for production of second harmonic was that the uh, 
refractive indices had to match for the fundamental and second harmonic. Here also refractive index multiplied by omega p n p multiplied by omega p equal to n s multiplied by omega s plus n i multiplied by omega i is the conservation of momentum condition. The moment you bring this in, it is sort of bringing in quantization, right? not all combinations of omega s and omega i are going to be now allowed, but still there will be many, okay? there can be many. Of course, we have already brought in some restriction here, remember we are talking about uh, collinear uh, geometry that is what will restrict things a little bit. Now, why am I not saying that there will be only one combination? Why am I still saying that there can be several combinations? N p omega p equal to N s omega s plus N i omega i. So, if N p is defined, N s is defined, N i is defined, then I should think that only one pair of values of omega s and omega i should satisfy this condition. Why am I still saying there can be several pairs? Yes, yeah. What do they depend upon? N s and N i are not constant, that is the answer, even N p may not be constant. What would they depend upon? Sorry? Uh, no, wavelength is frequency, right? Omega i, omega p, the, the automatically wavelengths are defined, it cannot be wavelength. Something else, something simpler, something you studied when you were younger, before you studied wavelength. Yeah? Uh, yes, maybe, but then uh, I am working with the same medium. I will not change the medium. So, that is one way, of course, you change the crystal, you can have different kind of uh, optical parametric generation. Suppose I work with the same medium, what can I change to change the refractive indices? What about temperature? Yeah, temperature. So, you can have temperature uh, controlled refractive index. So, therefore, uh, using changing temperature as we are going to demonstrate later on, you, are, you can actually get different combinations of omega s and omega i. Okay. So, temperature tuning becomes very important here. Right. Okay. So, this would be the simplest geometry in this case. So, what we have here is we have this omega p coming in focused on to z 1 and then here we have the nonlinear crystal okay here's the optical optic axis let us say we don't know what omega i and omega s are at the moment we only know omega p but let us say uh, they have been produced so what do you have you have a mixture of omega s omega i omega p okay and now suppose you want to take the idler out idler is uh, typically the lowest frequency lowest frequency means longest wavelength or shortest wavelength longest wavelength so, use a long pass filter. If you use a long pass filter, uh, you can choose to get only the idler out or you could use a long pass filter which will allow the idler as well as the signal to go out. And then by using a dichroic mirror, you can get the idler as well as the signal going in different paths. That is what is done in a commercial OPO or OPA. Okay. You can actually generate both, I mean we will generate everything but you can actually use both if you want. What is the problem? The problem is intensity, very, very small. So, first of all what you can do is like earlier, you can uh, do angle tuning for phase matching. That way you can decide omega s omega i and you can optimize uh, the conditions by which they come out. This we have to remember that signals are very, very low. See even some frequency we said typical uh, efficiency is like 20 percent. Here typical efficiency would be 2 percent perhaps or 1 percent or less depending on what kind of material it is, very low. And then depending on the NLO material, you can have type 1 phase matching or type 2 phase matching. Type 1, type 2 phase matching we have discussed in the uh, previous modules. Now, what is the application? The major application in this case is what is the range that is uh, available to us most easily. What is the range of wavelengths that is available to us? Suppose you are using a tie sapphire laser. The range of wavelength that is available to us very easily is red, right. 
from red we have learned how to create blue or even UV by second or third harmonic generation. Here we have learned how to create IR right and also how to create single photons. So, one application that we are not really going to talk about here today, but it is a very important application of optical parametric generation is that many times you want to do experiments in you which you generate only one photon that is done very easily here. Okay. You can do it by angle tuning, you can uh, do it by modulation of uh, intensity and all that. You do it in such a way that at an, an instant only one photon is produced and then you do whatever you want to do with it. Okay. Uh, do you know what is a very good detector for a single photon? Yeah, yes, our eye, our eye can actually see a single photon. If you are in a dark room and one photon comes in and it is if it impinges on your eye that will generate a signal, eye is good enough. Right. Now, let me uh, show you the schematics of construction of uh, an optical parametric oscillator. Where does this oscillation thing comes? We have a later slide where the schematic of oscillation is shown briefly. See, we have said that the efficiency is very less, right. So, if efficiency is less, how do you increase the efficiency? One is by amplification, which we will study later. The other is if you uh, make sort of a laser cavity and if you make the uh, signal beam uh, go around in the cavity uh, several round trips, then you can have some amplification, right. So, and note the date. Physical regulators fine, but which year was this published? 1965. So, uh, these experiments started more or less along with the invention of laser. The moment lasers were invented, people started thinking what can you do with them. Uh, perhaps I do not know whether they even thought that we are going to do pump pro spectroscopy and all that at that time. They just wanted to create single photon, they wanted to create correlated photon pairs, they wanted to have a mean of tuning the wavelength. So, uh, as far back as 1965 before any of us here were born, this thing was there okay. and here is the schematic. Again the active medium here is the ovidium ion, the different substrate. It gives you 1058 nanometer, 1.058 micron that is let us say omega 0. So, what they did was first of all they put in a lithium neovidate crystal, they called it T1 crystal and the work of this crystal is actually to do what we already know to, to generate the second harmonic 2 omega 0. Now, the moment you create second harmonic you know very well that the efficiency of conversion is only 20 percent or 15 percent, 10 percent, 8 percent something like that. So, there you have two wavelengths already omega 0 and 2 omega 0. Which one, which one is uh, omega p, which one is omega s? How have you defined it? What is the highest frequency? What is the largest frequency? What is it called? Pump signal or idler? No, highest frequency. Highest frequency is a pump. So, this 2 omega, 2 omega 0 is actually equal to omega p, that is your pump, and omega 0 is the uh, signal. Of course, in this case, idler will also have frequency omega 0 if, if you are going to use it like that. So, then here after that they had this infrared absorbing filter, which one will get removed? Omega 0 is gone, you only have 2 omega 0 here omega p. Okay. Then they had this second lithium neovidate crystal T 2 from which you are going to generate omega s and omega i. Okay. How can you do it? We have discussed already that if you change temperature then all these refractive indices will change. So, even for collinear geometry you can uh, get different uh, frequencies for idler, different frequencies for signal if you simply change the temperature and that is the experiment they actually did. Unfortunately, the 1965 many many years ago, so that time 
drawing graphs and all perhaps did not capture so much of attention like what we do nowadays, but you can see what is there on the x axis, what is there on the y axis. X axis is temperature degree centigrade right and it goes from 46 degrees to 66 degrees about 20 degrees and y axis what is y axis? Yeah, it is wavelength in micron. Okay. So, what you get is you get two branches you see these dots these are the experimental points the two branches this one is the signal this one is the idler is that right did I say the right thing why not idler is longer wavelength look at the y axis shorter values on the top longer values at the bottom the top one is 0 0.96 micron then this is 0 0.981 1, and the lowest one is 1.16. In 1965 people used to th think differently what can I do. So, what they have done is they have plotted from the, the lowest value of wavelength is on the top or you can think like this or they have written wavelength that is the issue highest value of frequency is on the top right. So, the, in this parabola that we have the points on the top are the signal points at the bottom are the idler okay and many times you see there are more points i don't know if you can see that you see there are more points in the top than in the bottom so many times they could not even detect the idler the idler got absorbed or intensity was too small they could not detect something like that signal is a little better that's why it is called the signal okay lower the frequency more difficult it is to detect Okay. I have no idea why it is called idler of all things because I mean it is as idle as in the, the signal I guess, but signal is a little easier to observe. Okay. So, by changing the wavelength uh, sorry changing the temperature here different omega s and omega i were prepared. Of course, you understand that for a particular value of omega s frequency of the signal frequency of the idler gets automatically determined right because frequency of pump is known that is 2 omega 0 1058 multiplied by 2 in nanometer right that is of course wavelength uh, uh, the frequency corresponding to that so at a particular temperature you get omega p is the same at all temperatures omega s and omega i values vary with the condition that omega s plus omega i is always equal to omega p that is 2 omega 0 next that this silicon filter which cuts out visible light and only omega s and omega i are transmitted. Okay. So, this is one of the first examples of optical parametric oscillator I have not shown the entire diagram here the entire diagram would look something like this where this nonlinear crystal is actually put inside a sort of a laser cavity a cavity. So, that the resonant signal beam gets amplified a little bit and signal and idler output typically travel in the same direction and then you can further separate them by using uh, no that is not that is in the next one by using a uh, using separation optics like uh, dichroic mirrors. Okay. So, the problem is that the intensity is very small. So, when intensity is very small you want to amplify it and that brings us to the principle of optical parametric amplifier. And when we discuss optical parametric amplifier actually two phenomena come to my mind when we discuss this one is Raman effect the other is stimulated emission and you see why I am saying this. So, what you see in this uh, diagram here is you have a, a stationary state ground state and you have a virtual state at higher energy compared to the ground state. Okay. Let us say that the pump frequency promotes the system to this excited to this virtual state. Okay. So, omega p takes the system to this virtual state here. Now, let us say and that is why this reminds me of stimulated emission. Let us say by some means I already have a little bit of omega s in the system. Okay. Now, what will happen? sort of stimulated emission. Okay. So, if it sort of stimulated emission would take the system from this higher energy virtual state to a lower energy virtual state 
difference in energies between which would correspond to the frequency omega s right. So, this is what you would get instead of 1 now you get 2 photons. The photon that perturb the uh, virtual state with higher energy and the photon that is generated as a result of lowering the energy from the higher to lower energy uh, virtual states. This is why it reminds me of stimulated emission and you can see where amplification comes in here right. One pump photon sorry one signal photon came in and two were produced right. Now, what happens to the remaining energy omega p minus omega s what would that be equal to omega i idler that would also come out automatically right. This is how this is the uh, very basic principle of optical parametric amplifier. Now, if you think uh, practically where will we get omega s from and then I want a tunable source right. So, I might want uh, as many possible values of omega s as possible. The best way of trying to do that is to generate white light yeah. Now, we are familiar with this concept of uh, the white light generation. We know that if we focus an intense femtosecond pulse on a substrate like calcium fluoride or uh, your sapphire earlier experiments were done by focusing picosecond pulse on uh, water D 2 O mixtures. Then you get something called self phase modulation and white light is generated. Of course, white light intensity will be nothing compared to the laser light, but we do not need a high intensity. We only need some photons that are going to cause this downward transition. So, a good strategy of uh, building an OPA would be you take your light laser light say 800 nanometer light out of an amplified out of an amplifier tisophyre amplifier split it into two parts. Focus one part onto uh, some substrate there sapphire filter ok generate white light ok. Then of course, you need optics to collimate the white light and all. Then on the uh, nonlinear crystal focus that white light and focus the residual part of the output of the amplifier. Now, what will happen output of the amplifier is going to serve as omega p. All the components of white light can in principle contribute uh, can act as omega s, but by uh, angle tuning the crystal and of course, by maintaining the some temperature you can select preferentially which of these frequencies of white light is going to act as omega s right. So, by angle tuning that is what happens in an OPA by angle tuning you can select the uh, signal frequency and the idler is generated anyway ok. So, you have actually generated two different colors already. Now, you decide whether you want to work with the signal or the idler generally we prefer to work with signal sometimes due to uh, some problematic combinations of optics and all the signal may not be all that accessible. And if you are fortunate that the idler frequency uh, idler intensity is large enough then you might actually end up working with the idler that is point number one. S point number two is sometimes you want to work with idler when do you want to work with idler what is the output of your tie sapphire amplifier 800 nanometer model model wave uh, wavelength. So, that is red uh, what is the constitution of the white light it is all visible is not it. So, typically your uh, omega s would be in the visible range suppose you want I r light how will you get it using all this if you want for some application suppose you want to do uh, an I r probe experiment or suppose you want to do an IR pump IR probe experiment something like that 2D IR. Then the only hope of generating IR from this uh, essentially visible uh, light giving system is to work with the idler right. So, the fre uh, frequency of the idler is essentially the difference of frequencies of pump and signal is not it. 
So, this process is called optical parametric amplification OPA, it is also called difference frequency generation DFG. Okay. So, what it essentially does is that if you have the right optics, then in fact it gives you tunability from anywhere to anywhere. So, what you could do and what is done in commercial amplifier uh, yeah, uh, commercial OPAs as we might discuss in the next uh, module is that first of all you have nonlinear crystals by which you do second harmonic generation. That gives you access to uh, blue and maybe even UV, you do third harmonic generation 800 by 3, how much is that? The magic numbers you have to know 800 by 3, you can either do arithmetic quickly or you have to know 267, right 266 that is a magic number third harmonic. So, third harmonic, second harmonic, fourth harmonic this uh, when you uh, are into lasers these things will occur to you automatically. 1064 is a magic number N D A G fundamental 532 second harmonic then third harmonic of that fourth harmonic of that all these numbers will come to us automatically. So, on one hand by uh, higher harmonic generation you can access U V right and not only that you do not have to be restricted to only the harmonics. Now, you can do this and generate signal in blue or maybe even UV. On the other hand, if you use the fundamental of the uh, amplifier 800 nanometer as omega p, then you can uh, get things in red and the difference frequency can give you I r. So, that is why an optical parametric amplifier, a single optical parametric amplifier which is properly uh, equipped with uh, the uh, right crystals and right optics and in good shape can give you tunability from 200 nanometer all the way to I r. That is the uh, strength of this piece of instrument okay. and the principle if you do not go into uh, very deep of it the qualitative discussion of the principle is quite simple. Okay. So, again this is an example of a uh, of one stage of an OPA typically OPAs would have several stages, but this is something that is there uh, and this is from the usual textbook that we use. So, let us say this is omega p 1047 nanometer and this is omega s 1.1 to 1.8 micrometer 1.1 micrometer means how many nanometer. 1100 nanometer. So, first of all I do not understand why this is 1047 nanometer and why that is 1.1 micrometer. I do not know, but we should not think that this is 1000 and that is 1 that is why I wanted, uh, I wanted to make this. So, here in this system that we are discussing actually your pump and uh, signal have not very different energies. Now, the thing to note is the difference in polarization and that has a role to play later. The pump is vertically polarized the signal is horizontally polarized okay. and the idler you will produce you are using lithium neon update. If you remember what we discussed in the earlier ones in L i n b o 3 we have E o o kind of situation if you take pump signal and idler. So, the idler that will be produced will have the same polarization as the signal not the pump. So, you change the temperature you angle tune it do whatever you want until you get signal and idler right. Signal and idler have the same polarization pump has perpendicular polarization. Now, it is very easy to uh, take the pump out just use a polarizer. Here they have used a Rokon polarizer you can look up what a Rokon polarizer is it is basically the same as Wollaston polarizer you have calcite or something which is cut into two and then joined again the regular stuff that you have been studying in organic chemistry rotation of polarization polarimeter that kind of thing. So, first of all when you use a polarizer the pump gets cut out and then depending on what you want you want the signal or you want the idler you are going to use a filter. The filter that is shown here is a germanium filter which will allow the idler to go through the smallest energy and it will not let the signal to go through. Okay. 
you can always use a dichroic mirror to send the idler one way and the signal the other way. That way uh, you have access to both. Okay. So, this is the principle of optical parametric generator and optical parametric uh, amplifier. Uh, what we have in our lab is an OPA not an uh, OPO. OPOs generally operate at much higher frequencies, similar frequencies as your tie sapphire oscillators. So, OPOs are very good for uh, things like up conversion experiments, femtosecond up conversion, femtosecond optical gating, because they can give you a continually tune, a tunable uh, range of wavelengths at high frequency 80 megahertz. That is what you need for your fog kind of experiments. But in pump probe generally one wants to use OPA because you need higher intensities right and OPAs once again they are limited by the uh, frequency that goes in and OPAs also have their own limitation not all OPAs can work at all frequencies. Typically you want to use an OPA which can work at the frequency of the output of the amplifier which in our case is 1 kilohertz right. So, typically OPAs are associated with higher uh, intensities higher number of photons I want to say I would do not want to say energy because we will get confused with H nu higher number of photons let us say and lower frequencies whereas, OPOs are usually associated with lower number of photons, but higher rep rates. Okay. Both have their own advantage both have their own applications and both are equally costly actually an OPO is I think more costly than OPA as you know amplifier of course, is more costly than oscillator because it contains an oscillator it has to cost more, but if you want an OPO that is why you will see OPAs everywhere OPOs are not all that common because OPOs are actually very expensive. And if you have a short enough pulse for a tie sapphire oscillator with uh, this sealed tie sapphire oscillators that we now have and with continuous tunability very often uh, people do not care for OPO anymore but in some applications it might be required. Okay. So, uh, that is what I wanted to say about OPAs uh, in the next module we will briefly discuss the construction of the OPA that we use and then uh, we have discussed uh, instruments for a long time. Uh, we want to discuss some actual experiments classical experiments uh, that have been done. Uh, we will uh, next go on to two, two experiments one is Ahmed Zuel's experiments that got him Nobel Prize in 1999. How much time does it take for a bond to break and how does a bond breaks? What he, what he called snapshots of bond breaking, we will discuss that in a module. Then I want to talk about uh, water a little bit because water is my favorite subject and in any case uh, our life is based on water. So, two things one is solvation dynamics in water Graham Fleming's work. The other is how uh, vibration energy is transferred from one mode to the other in uh, associated water molecules that is uh, Eric Nibering's work. And perhaps we will stop with uh, stop this section with Eric Nibering's work on uh, visible pump IR probe experiments. Then depending on how much time we have I want to talk a little bit about pulse shaping and I want to talk about uh, 2D experiments. If you get time we will talk about terahertz experiments as well. And the purpose of this course is that uh, we want to have an overview of all the kinds of different ultra fast experiments that uh, chemists across the world are doing at the moment. We are not going to talk about attosecond experiments because until now I believe that uh, there is no chemistry in attosecond. It may be a little atrocious statement to make, but then after all the, the reason why I am saying this is that it takes uh, hundreds of femtoseconds for a bond to break and chemistry starts with bond breaking. So, faster than that there are interesting phenomena there can be state to state dynamics, but at least in this course we are not going to talk about attosecond spectroscopy because that requires a different level of understanding. But these are the experiments which we want to discuss and while doing that we will have to come back to uh, instrumentation a little bit after this because I want to talk about pulse shaping because many of you might end up uh, in laboratories where you have to do pulse shaping. If you want to do a 2D experiment pulse shaping becomes extremely important. So, we will talk about that a little bit ok. So, much for today.